Yeah. Good day, everybody. My name is David Phillips, and I'm the director of the program on peace building and human rights at Columbia University's Institute for the Study of Human Rights. And we're so pleased that you were able to join us today for this historic discussion about the statement that uh, President Biden made on Armenian Remembrance Day. And of course, rather than looking in the rear view mirror, we wanna look forward and anticipate the consequences to that statement and how it's gonna affect not only Armenians, but US-Turkey relations going forward. So uh, before we start the panel, I just wanted to welcome everybody and uh, state very clearly and emphatically that there was nothing ambiguous in President Biden's statement. I'm gonna assume that uh, the audience has read the entire statement, but let me just extract a couple of relevant parts. According to President Biden, each year on this day, we remember the lives of all those who died in the Ottoman era Armenian genocide and recommit ourselves to preventing such an atrocity from ever again occurring. Beginning on April 24th, 1915, with the arrest of Armenian intellectuals and community leaders in Constantinople by Ottoman authorities, one and a half million Armenians were deported, massacred, or marched to their deaths in a campaign of extermination. We honor the victim, victims of Meds Yegern so that the horrors of what happened are never lost to history. He finishes his statement by repeating the term Armenian genocide. The Armenian people honor all those Armenians who perished in the genocide that began 106 years ago. So having interacted extensively with uh, Armenian Americans and the broader Armenian community around the world, I know how gratified uh, Armenians were to hear President Biden characterize the events as the Armenian genocide. I think their gratification was particularly strong in light of the recent developments in Artsakh, uh, where on the 27th of September, uh, Armenians were attacked by Azerbaijani special forces, uh, Turkish Bayraktar drones, and jihadists that were coordinated by Azerbaijan and Turkey. Uh, the loss of Artsakh, most of its territory, was a big setback, left Armenians reeling. Uh, the words that President Biden uttered on Saturday you know, partly mollified and reassured the broader Armenian community. The day before um, President Biden issued his statement, uh, he called President Erdogan to let him know what was coming. And during their conversation, Biden conveyed his interest in a constructive bilateral relationship with expanded areas of cooperation and effective management of disagreements. This didn't mollify Tayyip Erdogan. He criticized Biden's statement strongly, accusing him of bowing to domestic pressures. Turkey's foreign minister, Mevla Çavuşoğlu, said, Words cannot change or rewrite history. We have nothing to learn from anybody on our own past. Political opportunism is the greatest betrayal to peace and justice. We entirely reject this statement based solely on populism. The Turkish foreign ministry and other proxies of uh, Tayyip Erdogan said that Biden had opened a quote, deep wound that undermines our mutual trust and friendship. The ministry called on Biden to correct this grave mistake. There's no possibility of that happening. Uh, it did not, however, escalate the situation by recalling its ambassador in Washington. Uh, the Turkish government invited a US representative to inspect the Ottoman archives 
which have already been purged of incriminating evidence. Previous proposals for a joint history commission have been discredited. I can speak with authority given the work that I did as chairman of TARC, the Turkish Armenian Reconciliation Commission, uh, that there can be no dialogue about the facts. The facts are well known and well documented. The Turkish archives have been purged uh, and incriminating information has been removed or destroyed. I can also say that one of the major contributions of TARC, in addition to being the first structured dialogue between prominent Turks and prominent Armenians, was its request to the International Center for Transitional Justice to facilitate, to facilitate a legal finding on the applicability of the Genocide Convention. Uh, I can refer you, and maybe Maggie, you can send to participants a link to the study. Uh, it was concluded that uh, the events met the minimum definition of genocide and politicians, scholars, and historians were justified in calling them genocide. What to expect now? Uh, Turkish officials have threatened to freeze the 1980 Defense and Economic Cooperation Agreement that promotes collaboration with the US and regional conflicts such as Syria and Iraq. The PAC also enables intelligence sharing, joint military drills, and increased US military access to Turkish air bases. Erdogan has already threatened to deny the US access to an early warning radar system in Kurechik, a critical part of NATO's ballistic missile defense system. He has also threatened to suspend access to Inchirlik Air Base, which is close to Syria and is used by the Pentagon, Pentagon to store tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, in addition, Turkey has threatened to reduce cooperation with the West and focus its interest instead on Russia, China, and Iran as, their, as its primary security, diplomatic, and trade partners. It has also threatened to limit or cut food exports to Armenia that are transport, transported through Georgia. Uh, Armenia is a major uh, customer of Turkish food supplies. And within hours of Biden's statement, Turkey launched a cross-border attack against Kurdish militants in Northern Iraq. So what happens in Washington is always taken note of in Ankara and in particular Biden's statement was closely watched. I just got off the phone with a, a member of Turkish civil society who works on human rights and democracy promotion. And he said, so far the response has been muted. Even the opposition parties haven't really reacted strongly, but we know that Turkey is listening and watching. Erdogan is in full damage control mode. The Turkish lira extended its losses. It's now trading at 8.3 lira to one US dollar. Erdogan continues to blame the United States for harboring Fatula Gulen whom he holds responsible for a failed coup attempt in 2016. He continues to criticize Washington for its support for terrorism through its security cooperation with the Syrian Democratic Forces, which Turkey falsely maintains is the Syrian arm of the PKK. Uh, Kurdish fighters in Syria have been our boots on the ground in efforts to defeat ISIS. Relations between the US and Turkey were already facing a difficult time because of Turkey's purchase of S-400 surface to air missiles from Russia, um, as well as US support for Kurdish groups in Syria. Last year in 2019, the House and Senate <clears throat> passed resolutions recognizing the mass killings of Armenians as genocide. Uh, what will happen next? Will Erdogan successfully rally his nationalist base in response to Biden's statement? Or will he seek to diffuse tensions? Uh, 
Biden and Erdogan will meet in a bilateral summit on the margins of the NATO meeting in June. Leading up to that, will Turkey take a conciliatory approach or will it come to the NATO meeting looking for more conference, confrontation? Uh, Erdogan would be well advised to recognize that Turkish voters are, that he's losing support from Turkish voters, that dissatisfaction with Erdogan is rising, reflected in the party's election defeats, local elections in Istanbul, Ankara, and Izmir uh, in 2019. Turkey will have presidential elections in 2023. Uh, and it remains to be seen how Turks will respond. Will they rally around Erdogan? Will there be progress made in US-Turkey relations? And what will the Biden administration do next? So today we have a great panel to discuss these questions. Uh, they'll address the consequences to Biden's statement, whether the statement represents a strategic realignment for the US, or will US-Turkey relations rebound based on uh, conciliation and cooperation? To discuss these issues, uh, we'll first hear from my good friend, Bernard Kouchner, uh, France's former foreign minister, who played a very critical role during the 2009 negotiations uh, between Turkey and Armenia on the protocols. Um, I hope that Bernard addresses his role and what happened there in his remarks. We'll also hear from Dan Fried, who is the former Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, now with the Atlantic Council. Uh, I've interacted with, with Ambassador Fried extensively, and I've always found him to be an extremely capable diplomat, a person of great integrity. I'm very pleased that we've stayed in touch these years, Dan, and that you joined the discussion today. And then Van Krikorian will share his views. Van is the co-chairman of the Armenian Assembly of America, which played such a critical role in bringing uh, the Biden administration to the point where it made this, its statement on Saturday. So let's get started with the discussion. You've heard enough from me. Bernard, I'm going to pass the floor to you. Uh, please speak for not more than 10 minutes. Bernard, you need to unmute yourself so we can hear you, okay? You hear something? Yes. We can hear you fine. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry to be late. I pulled out. A little late, but for me, it was so difficult to join you. Okay, so I was listening to you as I'm back from this area from Armenia and uh, and Artsakh. Artsakh is the name of nagorno karabakh uh, This is difficult and in a bit difficult to understand what happened there. I know the place. I was there during the first Armenian and uh, well, Artsakh and Aziri people. It was in '92. And I was surprised because uh, we were not expecting the war. We didn't know anything about uh, the way, of course, Aziri and Turkish and Syrian and uh, volunteers were preparing the attack to Armenia. They were, they were not ready. Politically, it was difficult because uh, in the same time during the war, the war of 40, 40 days, 47 days, if I understand well. 44. 44, thank you. Well, uh, I didn't feel that they were really united in between, no unity between Atsak and uh, Armenia. And it was difficult to discover that only the volunteers, the young volunteers, without arms, I mean, bare hands, in fact, 
they were joining the, the, the battle in, in Artsakh and uh, unfortunately a lot of them were dying. So they were talking, all of them, Armenian and people from Stepanakerk. Stepan, Stepanakerk is the capital of uh, uh, Artsakh. They were, let's say, not prepared at all. The, the Armenian army, the volunteers in Artsakh, and uh, they were really in a big difficulty. And they were talking about the coming Russian people, Russian army, like people of peace, uh, peacekeepers, in fact. They were talking about the army as peacekeeper. And in fact, close to Stepanakerk, uh, it was impossible not to cross checkpoints and Russian army, etc. I know that it was too late. Uh, the Russian were not really fast enough to save a large part of Artsakh, but so I discovered difficult relation between the people of Stefanakerk, Artsakh, and Russia, and different feelings between Armenian people and Russia. And so what's the future, you, you were asking us, uh, David? Uh, I think that uh, there is a, a big political difficulty inside Armenia. When I came back from uh, uh, Stepanakerk, I was facing demonstration in the street of uh, Erevan and everywhere. They were attacking Peshishion, the new uh, prime minister, which was very well received when he came two, days, two years ago. And so the there is no political stability in, uh, in Armenia in order to find a way to go forward, to go to what, to go to peace, to go to future. So as they were talking, all of them, about peacekeepers, talking about the Russian army, I think I know about Putin, I know what he did, I know. Ukraine, I know, uh, of course, uh, everywhere, and he, he was attacking and he benefit of the situation because in that time it was the, the, the American election, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But don't you think about what you quoted, uh, David, about this summit in between the American and the Russian, that it will be the opportunity if the Russian wants to play a role in peacekeeping in a way to let them go or to go with the american if it is possible imaginable it's a dream uh, to the security council with a good resolution establishing a, di a line of communication not more than that a line of communication between uh, armenia and stepanakerk because in fact, coming back from this place where the people were suffering so much, of course, taking uh, in account all the first genocide and uh, I mean, the emotion of uh, facing Turkey another time, etc. Was it the second round of the genocide, etc. But we discovered that nobody was helping. Nobody was helping in that time. European Union was inert. Of course, my good president uh, say some good words, but nothing. Germany, nothing. Coming from Europe, nothing. Coming from United States, nothing but some words too. So as they were so isolated, for the time being, I don't want to, to talk too much. My idea is to make, to offer to Mr. Putin, and another time I, will, I know about Putin very well, to play the good boy and not the bad boy. If he is able to offer some resolution 
with the complicity, at least, the complicity of the others. We were not talking about, do you know that the group of Minsk was part of, uh, was involved in offering a solution since years and years. Nobody offered any solution. But I think that the, 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 the peace and not only the preparation of second round now, uh, rearming the, the Armenian army, et cetera, et cetera. It should be a cross with the, let's say, complicity of uh, Mr. Putin. This is the only way, but it, of course we should also note or discuss or take note of all, all what it means to talk about Putin in the same moment we are uh, offering and not offering uh, other sanctions to Russia, etc., Mr. Navalny, etc., etc. I know all that. But just for this part of the world, very important, because it was the first genocide of the 20th century. And uh, we have a debt with the Armenian. Uh, it will be a sort of, uh, let's say, to use this very bad and sometimes desperate situation in the benefit of the Armenian, which we should do. Of course, I can explain my very peculiar position. David. So let me just add a, a point of information. Uh, you were the foreign minister of France in 2009 when the protocols between Turkey and Armenia were negotiated. You waited in the aula uh, for the parties to show up for the signing ceremony. Yes. They finally did. We thought the protocols were a big breakthrough but they were never ratified by Turkey. So the work that you and others put in to bring it to that point was for naught. I remember I that. Yes, but well, uh, Turkey will not sign anything. Turkey is at the, in, in bad, let's say, political situation. Mr. Erdogan is not in a good situation. And I think that we have to use this uh, difficult situation. Otherwise, what will be done? Militarily? Do we have to fight uh, the, the Azeri army? No. It's too late, in fact. And uh, I was also a big uh, surprise by the, the attitude of the Russian. Uh, talking to the Russian soldiers was uh, easy. They, they, they knew the officers, the situation. Well-equipped army, uh, they are ready to stay. They said so, five years. We have to use these five years. It will not be done overnight. It will take, yes, but it's always the case. I know a bit about so, what I, I'm, I have some difficulty to use that word diplomacy, but sometimes it's worse. It works. Yeah. So we should use our time to convince the people to stop because for the Armenian, they are fed up with uh, fighting for the, the Artsakh people. Honestly, this is not a popular war at all. On the other side, they have no more illusion. This is a sort of del permanent delusion with the people of Artsakh. They were counting on our support, European Union and the United States and, and the others, and they didn't see anything. So we have also to comfort them. So I'm sure Van Krikorian will have something to say about that. But before we get to Van, uh, Let's ask Dan Freed to speak about his experience. He was in a senior position with the US government during all these negotiations. Dan, the floor is now yours. Thank you, David. 
Um, what President Biden did by recognizing the Armenian genocide is a big deal. And I know it's a big deal for Armenians around the world and for Van Krikorian himself. And I reacted with a kind of relief that at last the United States had just stopped the verbal obfuscation and made the call. I worked on this issue and was involved in preparing previous April 24th statements for many years. And we called it mass murder, atrocities. We, we used terrible killings. We didn't call it genocide. The Turks are mad that the United States has now called it a genocide. A lot of Armenians are frustrated that it took us so long to make that call. So the question was, what were we thinking? And I had to think about this at the time and afterwards. For many years, for many years, the United States looked at Turkey as a loyal and necessary NATO ally. This was during the Cold War. And there were many in the US government who regarded the issue of the genocide, the Metzgehem, as a historical issue and an impediment to good US-Turkish relations. I am not excusing this. I am explaining what the thought was. And in those years, the United States made a lot of foreign policy decisions like that. What I mean is turning away from difficult historical issues or current issues of countries that were not democratic because of the exigencies, because of the needs of foreign policy in the short term. When I started working on these issues, I and my colleagues took another approach because we did not want to be in the position of making our government genocide deniers. What we did was we had to understand and respect the fact that the presidents, that the presidents up until Biden this year were not going to use the word genocide to describe what happened in and after 1915. They weren't going to do it. So we had to work within that reality. But what we did were two things. One, to speak the truth as best we could, given the fact that we would not call it a genocide, which was not a comfortable place to be. But as I said to some of my colleagues, someday the United States is going to use genocide to describe what happened. And we do not ever, ever, ever want to be in a place where we denied it. So we didn't deny it, we just didn't use the word, which left a lot of Armenian Americans very and vocally unhappy, and I understand why. We operated as best we could, but we did something else. We pushed hard for Turkish-Armenian reconciliation to help Armenia and to help Turkey and to help Turkey. We wanted Turkey to get past its denial of its own history. This is not a remark directed at Turkey, but in general, countries, including the United States, can deny the historical reality of their own past. They ignore their own dark sides, as the United States did with slavery. And there is a price to be paid when you deny your own history, because you know you're lying on some level, lying to yourself about what happened. I always thought that the too many people in the South were willing to ignore the legacy of slavery and adopt a gone with the wind approach to their own history. There's a price to be paid when you do that. 
And there's a price to be paid when Turkey denied what had happened. But in the early years of the, of the AK party government, there were many Turks who wanted to deal with their own history, but also Turks that wanted to deal with their neighbors in a constructive way. Zero problems with neighbors was the foreign policy doctrine adopted by Ahmed Davutoglu, who was the Turkish foreign minister who actually signed the Turkish-Armenian reconciliation document in October, 2009. And that wasn't the only thing they were doing. They were reaching out to the Kurds, changing Turkish policy, moving it in a positive direction as part of a policy of deepening Turkish democracy so there wouldn't be military dictatorships again. This was a very hopeful period and we were leaning forward as best we could to help and to help Turkish-Armenian reconciliation. And when we learned, when I was told of the confidential discussions between Turkey and Armenia brokered and helped by the Swiss. And when the Turkish government asked for my help in supporting these, I did help. And those, we pressed forward on these because we thought it would be better for everybody if Turkey and Armenia could reconcile and if they themselves could find a way to describe what had happened in 1915 without us having to take the lead. And we, in the Bush administration, we got this document as far as being initial. And my colleagues in the Obama administration with Hillary Clinton and Phil Gordon in the lead moved it from, signature, from, from initialing to signature, which was not a small step, I can tell you. And Foreign Minister Kushner was there when it was signed. And good for them, good for the Obama people for carrying this forward. And reconciliation would have been difficult because there were people on both sides who opposed it. Azerbaijan was against it because, because of the Artsakh, because of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. And there were those in Armenia who didn't want to agree to it because it ruled out territorial claims. And there were those in Turkey who didn't like it. But the governments signed it and then they couldn't bring themselves to ratify. And that was a terrible missed opportunity. Mm. The Biden administration, this was the first April 24th statement that the Biden administration had to wrestle with and this was the decision they had to make. Do you take the hit now, the Turkish anger, which is real, or do you duck again and come up with euphemisms to describe what happened, which aren't necessary, which aren't lies. It's not a lie to say it was mass murder or an atrocity or killings or terrible deeds. Or, or, that's not a lie, but, and I'm not an Armenian American, but I have been told and I believe that to an Armenian ear, it sounds still like too close to denial. So they had to make a decision and they made the right one, in my opinion. As someone who had to advance, it, well, carry out a policy of not using the word genocide. And I did so to the best of my ability and so did my colleagues. But the Biden administration took a decision which is important and the Turks will be angered and they will, they are angered. And they talk about, you know, about the war in the 90s and Nagorno-Karabakh and you know, assassinations of Turks, including Turkish diplomats by Armenian extremists and terrorists. That's also part of the record. But, but the Biden administration made the call and they made the correct one. Now what? I hope that Turkey understands that this is not directed against Turkey any more than it is a slur on the United States to recognize that we put American citizens, Japanese Americans into concentration camps. And let's use that word. These were concentration camps. They weren't death camps, but they were concentration camps and we did it. Or our atrocity is against the Indians or, or slavery, our original sin. We did it. It is not a slur on America to say that we did terrible things. It is acknowledging the gap between our 
messy reality because we are flawed human beings and our ideals which are better. And I would argue the Turks can say the same thing. There is so much in Turkish history which is good and tolerant, enough to build a great future on. I firmly believe that. Well, as I said, David, um, Armenians will be angry that the United States took this long to use the word genocide. And Turks are angry that we have now used it. And I have and I've tried to explain some of the reasoning behind it as best I could. But I'm glad we, we took this step. I'm glad the Biden people finally took this step. And I hope that Turkey understands that this is not an anti-Turkish step, nor does it mean that we are blind to the, the mistakes Armenian, the Armenian government has made. Not the subject of this discussion, but it doesn't mean we're blind to that. It means that in this issue, we had to stop our verbal contortions. And I appreciate this opportunity to talk about this. Van Krikorian and you and I spoke at great length and I spent, I did a lot of traveling as part of the Minsk group trying to work on Nagorno-Karabakh solutions, not very successfully. The last thought is the United States also needs to help Armenia. It has been, I, need, I think Minister, Foreign Minister Kushner pointed out that Armenians are, have been trapped by the Nagorno-Karabakh, the Artsakh conflict, and by relations with Turkey. They need to build a prosperous, secure country of Armenia. And the United States needs to help them and respect them and do what it can. And I hope that that succeeds. Anyway, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Dan. Uh, having been in the room during many difficult discussions between Turks and Armenians, I can say without any hesitation that reconciliation can be achieved when Turkey acknowledges that the events constituted genocide and they apologize and consider reparations. Mm -hmm. Till we get to that point, until there's enough discussion among civil society, this rarefied conversation among diplomats will stay in the halls of diplomacy. We need to see Turkey transform. And I think that Biden's statement moves the ball forward. Van Krikorian, you've spent decades working on this issue. Uh, you and I have known each other for many years. I'm sure that what Dan and Bernard left on the table will inspire a lot of response from you. So let's hear about it. Dan, uh, Van, the floor is yours. Thank you. I, you are exactly right. Actually, I thought I was going to be the emotional speaker uh, on this panel, but having followed the previous two and, and your wonderful comments as well, David, I, I actually feel like uh, I'm going to end up being a little bit um, more objective and, and, and really uh, comment on what I think the immediate consequences are. On an on a initial note, though, one of the consequences is that uh, not just Armenians, but all victims of genocide, I think all potential victims of genocide, uh, owe all of all of you and President Biden and everybody else, uh, a deep thank you. Uh, each of the speakers um, has moved the ball forward in remarkable ways. And I don't think uh, this lifetime will be enough for us to say thank you. You know, when, when we think back to, you know, even people like Senator Proxmire, Senator Dole, all of those people who helped us along the way um, internationally, Ambassador Morgenthau. Um, it's mm. just remarkable. Raphael Lemkin, who coined the term and used the Armenian example as the def definitive example of genocide. When asked what's a genocide, it's what the Turks did to Armenians, which kind of settled the terminology issue for us. And on my sort of emotional side, and I think for all of us, um, 
I am absolutely thrilled that uh, my wife's and I first grandchild was born in December. And the first April 24th of, of his life saw a US president reaffirm the proud US record of acknowledging the Armenian genocide. We know that our parents, our grandparents, uh, all the victims' families uh, are also resting easier and smiling. And, and really, uh, it restored a lot of faith uh, uh, in hard work and also um, in America. President Biden showed America at its best. I think it is the America that we want to see. Uh, I know Dan's comments when he retired were inspirational for a lot of people in terms of what U.S. diplomacy should be in terms of values and when America is at its strongest. And I think that President Biden's statement did that, and that has a broader impact than just how it relates to Armenians and Turks today, it's showing America at her best. There's been a lot of speculation as to why President Biden did this. You know, and, and there's all kinds of objective and subjective factors. But for me, I, I really go back to 1989 when Senator Biden was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. And he was presiding over a contentious vote on whether to approve Senator Dole's genocide resolution for floor consideration. And, and it really was contentious. I remember, I, I absolutely remember it. We, we never worked as hard before in our lives to get it there. And that we had gone from a position where we had 62 co-sponsors down to 50, 51 on the fence. Uh, but it was considered and there was a vigorous debate in that committee and Senator Biden really took control and he said, I think the mere fact that we are having to debate whether or not there was a genocide is evidence of the fact why the Armenians feel so strongly about this. Elie Wiesel's comments were obviously more prophetic than I thought when I heard them. And that is that people have already forgotten. We don't even know. Educated men around this table obviously have been the victims of a history that was never written and that we are debating whether or not it occurred. He internalized all of that. And I think he, he shared the, the same value that he demonstrated that America is about being faithful to the facts, faithful to history and faithful to our values. And I think that's also reflected in the penultimate paragraph of of this statement where he says, a world unsustained by the daily evils of bigotry and intolerance where human rights are respected and where all people are able to pursue their lives in dignity and security. That's what's important. And I think that's the most important consequence of this statement. Um, with respect to what the immediate consequences are going to be we, we saw what happened after President Reagan acknowledged the Armenian genocide in 1981. Uh, it was followed by an extremely intense and well-funded uh, campaign of denial in government, academia, and the media. Uh, most of all, it was influenced by business. And among the factors that David recited in terms of Turkish reactions, we know now that U.S. foreign investors and international foreign invest, international investors in Turkey are starting to come under some pressure again to tow the Erdogan line if they want to keep doing business there. Well, back after President Reagan's 1981 proclamation acknowledging the Armenian genocide, that intensified deeply. Uh, there was the funding of uh, Turkish academic sites, uh, scholars who wanted access, who had any relation to Turkey were denied access unless they towed the line on genocide. And even the State Department reacted by uh, editing an article on Armenian terrorism to express doubt as to whether there was an Armenian genocide, specifically a note that said, because the historical record is ambiguous, the Department of State does not endorse allegations of the Armenian genocide. 
and our congressional friends told us you know, they reacted very strongly. The State Department eventually retracted the notes after a, a false start. Um, but that's what led this cycle of congressional resolutions to get the US record straight. And now we have that, uh, for which we are frustrated that it took so long, but we are also gratified that we got here. At the same time, we're concerned about the situation of Armenians in Turkey. Uh, 1980s, Turkish government put the Jewish community in Turkey under remarkable pressure. Um, it has done that in multiple other areas. We see what's happening to other groups that are being victimized by Turkey, and we are deeply concerned. Uh, we've had a lot of talk today about the most current issue of Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh, and that's a major issue too. In terms of reconciliation, a good initial consequence would be a recommitment to the OSCE and group principles and a commitment that the issue cannot be resolved except peacefully. And no further endorsement of the military solution which Azerbaijan and Turkey uh, and the jihadists imposed. Most significantly, uh, and, and I know there was a comment before that n nobody saw this attack coming. W we saw and actually publicized that starting in May of last year, President Erdogan was sending out these kinds of nationalist, anti-Armenian racist dog whistles that continued throughout the year and culminated in the September war that they initiated. Turkey has no business being in Azerbaijan. Turkey has no business attacking Armenians again. Turkey uh, needs to back away from that and give its civil society space, not by jailing journalists, not by covering up the murder of uh, Haran Dink, for example, or others, but by giving their people space. If they agree that the principle that they govern themselves by is democracy and rule of law, if they agree they aspire to any kind of global or even European standards, then the proof is in the actions. And we stand ready as we have before to work with them, as we have found as difficult as it is to work with, uh, with people who disagree with you, sometimes vehemently, by coming together and dealing with those issues, you can uh, solve problems peacefully in a way that makes the world a better place. I'm going to stop here, uh, even though I've only gotten about 10% through my presentation because I'm looking at the time. And I, I am confident that people got the gist of what I was saying. And also my incredible discomfort at the number of people we are going to have to thank for bringing us to April 24th and mm -hmm. President Biden's state. So not for the last time, but thank you all again. Thank you, Van. So the first question I'm gonna to direct to Bernard Kushner. Uh, Van talked about the OSC Minsk group, and you did as well in your remarks. The deployment of Russian peacekeepers wasn't the result of a Minsk group initiative. The Trump administration didn't pay attention to the Minsk group and the US really didn't play a role. I think we all recognize that the Minsk group should be more active and more effective. So what can we do going forward to restore the credentials of the Minsk group and to engage the US and France as a counterweight to Russia's near abroad? Bernard? Well, uh, I know that uh, it was a very important declaration coming out from uh, President Biden. Of course, I was uh, too short on that. Certainly not because I didn't salute that energy and courage. Certainly, he was very well inspired. But we did so a lot of years before. My country and the European country, and etc. Okay, so we all now 
recognize the, let's say, not the actuality, but the, historically that it was a genocide, clearly. And when you are used with the area, it was very visible in all the generation coming after the genocide, in the youngsters, in etc. So it is always difficult. It's easy to to say that they, it, we need a reconciliation between the, 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 the Armenian and the Turks, the Turks and the Armenian. Yes, I, I'm in favor of that, of course, I'm in favor, but it will take years and years. We, we are in a, in a very electric position facing Putin, facing uh, the Turks, facing the, the alliance, the so-called alliance in Libya with the Turks and Putin, et cetera, et cetera. And now Mr. Biden is coming, fortunately, fortunately, and I pay respect and highest consideration to that. But well, the people are facing each other and every day, not only there is a, a, a lot of uh, lost people, certainly they, they are dead, I mean, coming from uh, uh, Artsakh, but uh, incident every, every, every day, and we should have a, a move to, not only to help Armenia, but a sort of political attitude. And it was, sorry to, I don't want to tell you the, the rest of my life, but it was exactly the same, completely uncomparably in Kosovo. We were absolutely, you see, it was very difficult to talk about peace and reconciliation, but it, it, it has come more or less. So it will come, I believe, and, there is no other possibility with the people, Russian people, in the middle of the crisis. They are not comfortable, and this is not certainly a, a good position to negotiate for the rest of their problem, for the rest of the Mr. Putin problem from uh, the coming election. It's no election is elected to 36. No, but uh, I believe we, I was feeling that not no other solution, it will be difficult to get such a solution. It will be very difficult to negotiate. But I remember when the group of Minsk was in charge, uh, Lavrov, and uh, at that time it was uh, Madame Clinton, and et cetera. And, and it was impossible to let them talk to each other, in fact. So this is not the same situation. The feeling is the same. Yes, David, you're right. They have to recognize Gen the Turks, they should recognize the genocide. And fortunately in Turkey, there are a lot of, uh, uni I mean, professor, people, uh, law lawyer and uh, historical people, they are working on that, the way they are able to work in such a situation. But this is very important in the academic, academic world. But it will take years and years, meanwhile, should we have to help? Clearly, uh, I mean, the Armenians, this is, it will be easy, but the people in Artsakh, it will be much more difficult. So we, we don't have to come back too much to the, the, the Stalin period, but why they, they were circling in blue on the map, Stepanakerk and, 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 and Nachitchevan and etc. Was it to to have the possibility of a confrontation? No, it was not. Uh, but history is not the only, let's say, background. We have the people, they are fed up with war. The youngsters, they want to get job, to develop the, their society. And there will be, I suppose, a real support of such a peaceful going by the UN solution and developing a sort of pre-reconciliation period. So you talked about a UN solution and you've also supported the Minsk group. I think a theme to your comments, Bernard, is the importance of multilateralism. The Turkey-Armenia protocols would not have been achieved if you and Hillary Clinton and Sergei Lavrov hadn't been working together. So multilateralism is critical going forward. And we hope that in the next stage, particularly with President Biden's emphasis on 
transatlantic cooperation, that we can find ways of working collaboratively towards a shared goal. Just to, just to remind you something, who refused to sign the document? The Armenian president in that time. So that doesn't diminish no. the importance of multilateralism. But now let me turn to Dan Fried with a question that comes from Mike Lemon, former US ambassador in Yerevan. Um, Dan, Mike asks about whether or not a truth and reconciliation commission between Turks, Armenians, and Azeris is possible now that Biden has recognized the genocide and in the aftermath of the Karabakh war. What's your thought about a TRC? Um, I haven't been in the South Caucasus in a few years. So my information is rusty. I think there's an opportunity I think the Armenians are hurting because of the defeat. I worry that the Azerbaijanis are in a kind of triumphalist mood and, in, and just enjoying being on top. But it's something if the United States and Turkey want to see the South Caucasus as something other than a place of you know, instability and occasional war, then it's in our interest to help with these processes. It's in Russia's interest too, if they were in a more constructive frame of mind, but that's a, that's a topic for another kind of a discussion. My ideal scenario is that Turkey decides it's been fighting with the United States over various issues for long enough and wants to get past this and work with the Biden administration. And one of the things we could work on together is okay. Turkish Armenian Azerbaijani reconciliation in the aftermath of the war. And it shouldn't just be us. You no, know, the EU, France, you no, know, hard to think Russia playing a constructive role in anything these days, but you know, you, you this would be the best case. Whether it's possible, I can't say, but it certainly would be in US national interests. Mm -hmm. The The genius of American foreign policy, when we're doing it right, and we often don't do it right, but when we do it right, it's because we understand that our interests are advanced through peace, reconciliation, and the rule of law. Mm -hmm. Okay, we don't know, you know, we often get this wrong. <laughs> the French pointed out when we do, and they're often right, they're often right. But when we get it right, this is what we stand for. And we project what the Europeans thought was that naive American optimism and spirit of possibility onto difficult situations. And once in a while, we really land it. We nail it. That's old fashioned. But that kind of role is important. And, you know, to Mike Lemon, I'd say, man, It would be in everybody's interest if Armenia could start becoming as, you know, as successful as so many Armenians are. These are really smart people, kind of famously capable and smart and good, you know, at getting stuff done. Liberated from, we all need to be liberated from our past sometimes as countries to move ahead. Anyway, go, those are, those are just some reflections. Let me just add that it's my view that a, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission is part of a process. It's too soon to institutionalize that process, but to have a dialogue, uh, to be, begin to address humanitarian and reconstruction issues can bring us in that direction. 
it's better to talk than to confront. Uh, unfortunately, the situation now is an open wound, but hopefully we can move forward. I see what you're saying, David. I, I, I see what you're saying. Start with the practical and the immediate, not with the hardest, hardest issues mm -hmm. and build from there. Right, got it, makes sense. Mm. Let me direct uh, this question to Van. Um, it comes from Frayi Japujian, who asked whether the Biden statement will open the door for lawsuits by Armenians who lost property during the genocide. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't see that really at all. I don't think the statement was designed to do that. The legal situation is fairly complicated because, you know, after the physical genocide, Turkey uh, enacted laws, which, you know, we won't call it legal genocide, but basically gave people so much time to come and reclaim their properties. The peace treaties between the two countries did the same. I don't think this statement is about that. I think that compensation uh, for those enormous losses for restoration, I think, um, I, I haven't checked, but at, at one point I presented evidence to one committee that, you know, before the Armenian genocide, there were over 4,000 Armenian churches and, and cultural centers. And then, you know, by the, the mid nineties, the patriarchate had jurisdictional only of about 50 of them because so many of them had been taken and destroyed. Um, and, and some are still being destroyed in Turkey and we're, we're seeing them being destroyed in, in Azerbaijan at, 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 and on very alarming terms. Um, so, you know, to, to, to segue to Mike Lemon's question, you know, the first thing you have to do is stop the bleeding. Uh, that bad behavior has to stop uh, and that's why I think the statement is so valuable. With respect to the protocols and one of the other speakers' comments, I, I recall our Armenian president did sign it and then Turkey linked it to Nagorno-Karabakh after that was explicitly ruled out, which is why the US took the position that the ball was, was in Turkey's court. But I fully agree that Artsakh is a test. Artsakh is a huge test. Relations with Armenia are a test. Turkey often complains about anti-Muslim prejudice that you know, Europe is keeping it out because it's a Muslim country. Well, it didn't used to be such a Muslim country. It had a very vibrant, significant Christian population, which was eliminated during the Armenian genocide. The sooner it comes to terms with that, I think, and, and we know civil society in Turkey is far more advanced than civil society in Azerbaijan, which is more of an authoritarian state. So, so keeping those distinctions in mind is, is relevant too. Ar Armenia is a democratic country. Artsakh is a democratic place. People speak their minds. Um, there are elections scheduled for June. And you know, we, we are resilient people. We will, we will pick ourselves up. And we, um, as I think everyone will attest, will not give up, not just in our own interest, but also because we have this legacy of what happened and how it ought not to happen to others. And I think the last piece of that is that the US action, to go back to the question, is going to make it easier for other countries to do the same. And we were very happy to see the Indian ambassador in Armenia follow suit and recognize the Armenian genocide as well. We can expect more of that and a positive trend. That's what we're praying for. And let me ask a follow-up question that has a legal component, and then we'll go to closing statements. Um, Harry Millian asks if the Genocide Convention is retroactive now that Biden's made his statement. And we also have a question from Garo Kamarian about Turkish civil society pressuring the government to respond in a positive way. So could you quickly address those two questions about retroactivity and the role of civil society? Sure. I, I think that the legal consensus is the genocide convention itself is not retroactive. It is prospective. 
the rules for interpretation say that unless a treaty such as the Genocide Convention state that they're retroactive, that they're not retroactive. At the same time, there's this deep misunderstanding about what the Genocide Convention does. It calls for countries to prevent uh, genocide and it calls for them to punish perpetrators of genocide. So the perpetrators are, are all dead. Prevention is still a live issue though. Uh, Dan was talking about you know, the history of presidential statements and I was looking back at um, the first President Bush's statement uh, in 1990 after the Dole Resolution, he called it a crime against humanity. And I know that that was a term that was repeated several times. So the legal discussion would take a very long time and I, I just will be brief with those answers. The best solution though, um, would be a solution in which Turkey itself came to terms and realized, and, and David, you know, during TARC, we talked about this at great length about what else is necessary, you know, to heal the wounds between the neighbors? Because 90% of Armenian homelands, certainly where my parents, my wife's, my wife's family, our families, most of Armenian Americans' families are from, is on that western side of Armenia. So we discuss many of these issues in our sessions with, with Tark. Maggie, maybe you could post or make available a link to my book about Tark, which is called Unsilencing the Past, because a lot of uh, these issues are discussed on those pages. Now, let's move to closing statements. Let's try to keep it between one and two minutes, and we'll go first to you, Bernard. There is no comparison uh, of a so complicated issue even to start this uh, work of memory or like uh, between the, 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 the Armenian and the Turks. And if you are considering what the Turks, Erdogan, Erdogan, as you said, rightly, Erdogan is doing everywhere, all, all around Mediterranean Sea. He will not surround it at all. And it was a big victory for him, this uh, war in uh, Armenia. So he is comforted. The position of Putin is much more difficult to perceive. But uh, there is a sort of uh, understanding in between the two dictators, not the same way, etc., not the same way to be elected, to stay in power, etc. But to give them the possibility of uh, having this, uh, well, uh, resolution, I don't know if it will take years, I know, but um, this position of uh, compromission, realism, just to get away in between Artsakh and uh, Armenia. It will be for the future something difficult to get, but something possible to start right now. The approach, the diplomatic approach. Uh, and uh, for the rest, of course, I have another time to salute uh, Mr. Biden's declaration. You have a very, very interesting and good president. You're lucky enough. I don't- You're well, muted, David. Yeah. I just wanted to agree with Bernard. Finally, we have a constructive president. We all welcome his statement and his leadership. Dan, Fried, let's turn to you for your closing statement. I like the suggestions for practical ways to move ahead for the options we've got in the midst of, uh, in the aftermath of Biden's decision, in the aftermath of the, the second Artsakh war, if you want to call it that, 
Yes. It's a mess, but it's an opportunity. And I like the spirit of moving ahead. The United States, France, the EU, Turkey can play a role in the South Caucasus. And I also like the notion of Turkish, I don't wanna give up on, on Turkish democracy. Um, Turkish NGOs, Turkish society was often a lot, a much farther ahead than the nationalist parts of society. I, they're outnumbered, but they're not, but they're not alone. So I like the practical suggestions. I think that's the way to go. I think <clears throat> the Biden administration has some <clears throat> is, has, is going to face a rough period ahead. It has to be realistic about what can be accomplished in the immediate term. But let's start thinking about ways to make it right. And mm -hmm. thank you, David, for organizing this. This is, this is important. Well, thank you, Dan. And thank you for talking about Turkish democracy. Uh, we have to lament, however, that many Democrats in Turkey are now languishing in jail, that the country's putting pressure on the HDP, that members of parliament like Selahattin Demirtas have been imprisoned for years. So we can talk about Turkish democracy, but in practice, there's not a lot to talk about. Mm -hmm. Van, let's turn to you for a closing statement. Sure. And, and I'm going to go in, in a different direction than, than I had imagined, um, except to note, you know, this Biden action, President Biden action, it, it really is America at its best. Genocide begets genocide, and that needs to stop. Uh, picking up on what Dan just said, though, um, and looking, looking into the future, we also need to thank all of those courageous Turkish people uh, who did come to terms with their own history. We know it's difficult for civil society in Azerbaijan. Uh, on a personal level, and, and I think a lot of Armenians listening have the same story. I know you've heard it before, David. My grandmother watched her whole family be slaughtered, and then she was put into slavery until she could escape. Um, and then was smuggled out and made her way to the United States. Um, that's very painful still. Uh, at the same time, my father's family was saved by Turkish friends uh, who said, this, they're coming to kill you, you have to leave now. That good and evil that exists in every society is constant. Dan made a good point about saying it's constant in the US, you did the same. And and that's, I think, what we need to take from this and to come up with concrete actions. They are not to make racist statements as President Erdogan continues to do. And beyond this statement, we, we also commend the Biden administration and the House and the Senate for their actions in 2019. Um, and everybody who stands up for that same principle as, as we stand ready to reciprocate and help other victims to make uh, make real practical steps going forward. And thank you for, uh, for hosting this, David. Well, thank you, Van. I, I wanna commend each of you, not only for your participation on the panel, but over many years, each of you in your own important way uh, have advanced the goal of truth and justice. And we hope that working together and having this kind of dialogue, we can think clearly about the Biden administration's role going forward. Its statement recognizing the Armenian genocide was a huge step forward. Prior to the NATO meeting in June, we need to think together about what agenda items Biden and his team should consider when they sit at the table with Erdogan and company. Uh, as Dan Fried pointed out, diplomacy is hard work. It takes time. Through the participation of civil society and former diplomats like Bernard and Dan, I'm hopeful that we can move forward and actually achieve reconciliation based on truth telling.
So with that, let me adjourn our meeting. Uh, word of appreciation to Bernard Kushner, my old friend with whom I worked on Kurdish issues, to Dan Freed, who uh, was so helpful and formative in our work on dialogue and reconciliation, and my friend and partner in many different areas, Van Krikorian. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks for a good session, and I look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Thank you, David.